then things got in the way. So we'll use this as an example of the low bar for presentation standards <laughs> at uh, intersections. So what we'll be doing is we'll be uh, discussing a uh, paper by, uh, uh, I don't know, I guess a computational scientist or maybe a logician or I don't know where Philip Walder is in, the, in, that, in that space, but he has a paper about propositions and types. And it's, uh, as a paper, it's somewhat interesting in that uh, it's not, it's more of a history of what came to be this thing that created our isomorphism, which um, if you've uh, dug, you know, anybody on the surface level of uh, functional, any level of functional programming, you've probably come across the track. Um, and so the, so to give this in a presentational context, I, I didn't really know what to do because there was so much material there that to go to any depth would take too long and obviously a lot of work, which I'm averse to. And, uh, but also to, to talk about the surface level, it's very conversational. So what I thought I would do, um, because having a conversation with most 20 people is difficult, I thought I would try to give, so I, I thought I'd just try to give an overview of the paper, but I really invite any of you to ask a question or look for clarification, and I invite you to just make your opinions and, 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 and uh, on such a thing. So I'll try to do, uh, most of it on the board myself, and I'll flush out some of the definitions. So if you're not familiar with things like lambda calculus or simply type lambda calculus, we'll kind of cover that. I don't know how long it's going to take, and that's why if you need to be going, you need to go. Um, so since some of you might go, thanks for coming. Okay. So uh, yeah. So I I thought for a while like we have this um, this propositions as types, uh, and as as Philip Walder. Uh, says very pointed here, there's, there's actually three correspondences in this isomorphism. The correspondences are, if you have on one side a logic, what is happening this thing? Uh, and on the other side, you have uh, programming languages. And uh, I'm being very uh, loose here with the terminology just to show this, the spirit of the thing. Uh, there's this sort of isomorphism where you have propositions in the type. So the goal of the paper was to show or, or to discuss how they how there came to be these relationships between these two sort of disparate fields. So you have logic on one end, programming languages, and computer science on the other, and it turns out that for some kind of logic or for some kind of programming languages you can represent types of propositions the same. And what's even deeper than this, that is pointed out in this paper, is that not only do you have this uh, relationship here, but you have two more levels. So we have two more things we deal with in logic. We deal with proofs, and we also simplify proofs. And it turns out that there is also a, a uh, morphism on the other side where proofs are programs to simplify a proof is actually to provide an evaluation strategy. And you can think of a lot of contexts where this might be important. Like, for example, we have all kinds of different programs. Well, that should mean that we have all kinds of different proofs. And, well, we, we know of a few different evaluation strategies. Uh, there are non-strict, strict. There's also uh, rewrite rules and lots of things you can do, and this turns out to be sim similar to simplify. And so when I started reading this, I started immediately trying to think like, well, what's the motivating thing here? Like, why, how, how is it that we even have a relationship between logic and programming languages? Like, what's at the heart of this, or this thing? And it's a, it's a difficult uh, thing to motivate, but uh, one, one way to just see it sort of simply is, suppose we take uh, a very simple logical statement. A, uh, I'll use Steve's notion of implication as just arrows. A implies B implies C implies D. And if I if I supply this thing with values A, or sorry, with I'm not being very formal. My I have some. This is in my logic. So A, B, and C. These are propositions. So if I or, or, or whatever there's primitives in this, in this logic. If I provide A, B, 
and C, I can reduce this statement using the rules of modus ponens to D. And the reduction takes three steps. So, you know, the first reduction, you have these elimination rules. That will it was shown by uh, Alfonso Church and Dali Turing actually separately that it was impossible. But it really begs the question, and this was asked of David Gilbert, what is an algorithm? Or in, in also in his words, what is effectively computable? Uh, At the same time, Alfonso Church, a logician, Church was looking for a notational convenience for dealing with proofs. Because if you've ever seen the proofs and they show some of them, there's words. And so he invented something called for notational, notational convenience, invents the lambda calculus. It was very good that he invented it for notational convenience. Yeah, <laughs> and it's it's very simple. It has variables. Uh, so some variables like x, y, z, and it has uh, these are basically the rules. There are variables, and there's something called application. And that is, uh, you, know, you can have statements E1 apply, or in this it's uh, E2 apply, E1 apply to E2. And you have abstraction. So these are all the ways that you can write things in the Lambda calculus. The abstraction is that. Uh, Lambda x e, and it means that uh, it returns e when given x. Uh, if you have an expression x e, and you use the application idiom, so if you apply, if this expression is applied to the value f, then this gets beta reduced to the expression E, where F is substituted with X. It's, I mean, he's writing down very formally what is something that's so intuitive, so the rule is a bit obnoxious, but basically, if you want to apply the function, you plug the function in where all values are. When they actually define this, there's so many little cases like this variable in scope, that variable in uh, scope, but it's, it's, uh, it's just really the, the intuitive definition. Is, it, is everyone following along pretty good? I'll, I'll show some examples. It applies that function twice to what x is. And when they say, so this is an example expression. And when they say we're able to encode the natural numbers in this language, what they're meaning is that we have entities in the lambda calculus that carry the properties of the natural numbers. That is, they have addition, they have a successor method, they have subtraction, or whatever. Um, another example, uh, very fun, uh, how you actually apply beta reduction for lambda x. So, um, we have lambda x, 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 like lambda x, x, x. So, uh, so we use here the, um, uh, we'll use beta reduction right in this step. So then this becomes, we take this statement and plug it in there. So this becomes, well, it actually just reduces, you can see, well, here. Well, I don't know it's that. <laughs> it reduces the same thing. So if I, if I called this f, okay, and I plugged it into there, I would get you know, lambda x, 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 apply to f, which would beta reduce to f, f. So you can see that this, that uh, this actually just reduces to the same thing again. So that is that omega beta reduces back to omega. So again, if, what does that mean? I don't know. But, uh, it's cool. And there's also another fun little thing in the lambda calculus. There's a reason I'm defining this thing. F, which is So this is our application here. So f is something in the lambda calculus. 
G is something in lambda calculus we haven't defined yet, but I'll just give it a name. So this is equal to lambda f of lambda x of x. Sorry. F of x, x. applied to G. So we're going to substitute G for F in all these equations. So then this beta reduces to lambda x G of x x, lambda x G of x x. Now I can uh, beta reduce again by taking this as an expression. So if I define this as some expression, I can substitute it in for x here. And this beta reduces, sorry, my block. So I can define this as an expression, and then beta reduce it again by substituting it for x in here. So you get g of lambda x, g of x, x. I think I'm missing something out. No, because where did my lambda x come from? So I, my, I, my algorithm went on and I could not get an answer. 
room. So because of this non-termination, non-termination, it can't be a good candidate for well. Because of its non-termination, uh, Klein and Ross were saying, well, this isn't really a consistent entity to do to make decisions on because you you you, you don't encompass the whole space. Um, this is also related, you know, similar to the halting problem in the sense that, I mean, all this is related to the halting problem, but you, yeah, you can't determine if, the, if certain proofs are going to determine or not because of combinators like this. So that was, uh, that was, you know, not really a blow to the lambda calculus, but it inspired uh, Godel to say at the same time, no, I don't accept this definition. In fact, I'm because I'm Godel and I'm a genius. I'm going to come up with my own definition of effective computer. So Godel, calculus business. Uh, Godel or Gödel, this match is fun to say. So Godel <laughs> says, well, uh, defines effective computability. Ability as anything that is anything definable as a general recursive function.